Welcome to Weddings Unveiled, the podcast designed to help you build a productive, profitable wedding or event business. Here's your host, Angela Profit. Hi, y'all. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of Weddings Unveiled, professional tips and secrets on wedding planning and event design, where we take you behind the scenes of our past experiences in the industry and share with you what we have learned from them and how they have made us stronger. This podcast will help you grow a productive and profitable business to launch you into success within the hospitality industry. Before we get started today, I want to ask you something. Are you looking for the missing piece of the puzzle to grow your business? Well, I want to invite you to watch my free online training on how I went from hobbyist to celebrity wedding planner and how you can do it too. You will discover the puzzle pieces that will absolutely transform your business from hobbyist to like, hell yeah, I can do this full time. On puzzle piece one, I'm going to go all into personality. Puzzle piece two, how to keep the high quality clients happy. Puzzle piece three, I'm going to talk about what separates the good from the great. On four, best kept secrets to profitability and all about implementing the strategies. And five, If you're going to attract the best, come on, people, you got to be the best. And then I'm going to show you how to create the magic and put it all together for you and your clients. So don't wait another minute. Go on over to go.angelaprofit.com. That's go.angelaprofit, two F's and two T's, dot com. And watch my free videos and download my free workbooks that will take your business to the next level. Hi, y'all. It's Angela Prophet. Thank you so much for joining me today on another episode of Weddings Unveiled. Today, I am super excited to talk with my great friend and amazing creative. She is the owner of Kathy Thomas Photography and Collective 615. Welcome, Kathy. How are you? Good. How's everyone out there? I'm sure everyone is doing great, especially if they're listening to this podcast because they know exactly. they're going to get amazing yeah. nuggets today. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Be prepared. Be prepared. <laughs> yes, like I love all the people that I've been talking to, and I've, I'm serious. I've never gotten so many compliments where people are like, "Thank you so much for asking these questions, and thank you for being real and not sugarcoating stuff." And so. Um, yeah, just be real today. Just, you know, let it, let it, what do they say? Let it rip, let it roll. Is that a rap song? <laughs> I think you can let, yeah, all of that. I, you know, I'll do everything and I'll try to censor myself a little bit too in this process. I always do that whenever I get ready to talk. It's like, don't swear, don't swear, don't swear. <laughs> um, well, I, yeah, I have a problem with that. I grew up in that household where my dad, it's like every other, I mean, just his job and the environment and, Yeah, I have a problem with that. My mom's. I had contractors in my house every morning at four a.m. getting ready to go out to like build stuff. So you can Uh imagine what my environment was like. Uh huh. Aren't you the one that sent me a link that said if you swear and cuss, people trust you more? I think you are. Oh no! It was not that you swear and cuss. It it talks about (laughs) your brain level activity is much higher. Your IQ is higher. A higher IQ. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) I I'm just gonna say that is completely correct. Right? That's why we're such great friends. <laughs> Regardless of what anyone else out there says, that is yep. 100% correct. Yep. So for our listeners who have not seen your beautiful photography work, and and there's a lot that I didn't even know until recently about your background and the very luxury brand that you built that you are going to tell us about. So girls, um, you'll really want to pay attention to this one. And so let's just start off and tell our listeners a little bit about your background. Okay, I will. Um, I have to first add, it's funny that you say that about like not knowing what other people have done. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had the opportunity to meet with Jess Voss, who is the lead in Wicked right now. Um, and we hung out awesome. one time. Yeah. And she used to be in finance. So she was a, in finance in New York City, Weird. obviously coming from a big Jersey household. And when she told her parents she was leaving finance and their education she'd paid for to go sing on Broadway, you know, I think they were a little shell shocked. And now, you know, mm-hmm. 
Look definitely not the case. So I said to her, um, you know, it's one of those things where listening to another woman who kind of takes that act of bravery, um, because that's what it takes to leave a, you know, a, a corporate traditional job to go, Oh, I'm going to go be a creative. And, um, I don't know what that looks like. And, I don't know how I'm going to do it and support my family, but guess what? Like throw, you know, throw my cell to the wind. This shit's, see, I can't do it. <laughs> um, this stuff's going to work. good. And if it doesn't, here's the deal. I fall flat on my face and I go back to what I know, right? That's right. Um, <laughs> I, I think that's with everything. I'm like, I love the whole phrase, like throw it to the wall and see if it sticks. Yep. Uh, like spaghetti. It it's almost every morning. Like some people wake up and do like yoga. I throw stuff to the wall and see if it sticks. Uh-huh. Um, so I started my career, like I was a gap girl and climbed the ladder in retail through management. Um, found myself with lucky brand jeans. I'm starting in Florida and then soon moved to the mid Atlantic in Philly running their mid Atlantic at a, you know, I should have been worrying more about where the hat next happy hour was versus running big multi-million box retailers. But <laughs> that's kind of the path that my life, life led me on. Um, Lucky Brand Jeans moved me from Philly to cover the entire Northeast, um, and I moved to New York City. So this was that little, like, small town Wyoming girl growing up in coal country, and now I'm in New York City um, before the age of 30 running Lucky Brand Jeans on the East Coast. And um, where did Lucky take you? <laughs> well, Lucky, I mean, Lucky was amazing. Let's, let's just say, you know, it's when you look back at something and go, wow, we had it really good back then. Yeah. Um, and I always say like my master's degree, cause I, I, I moved from Louis Vuitton to Louis Vuitton or from, sorry, from Lucky Brand to Louis Vuitton. Uh -huh. And of course, once you're in a, a luxury brand, the most powerful luxury brand in the world, a lot of people ask you where you got your master's. And I had always said, Liz Inc. People are like, where's that? And I'm like, Liz Claiborne Inc. I was with <laughs> them through, um, they're acquiring Juicy Couture. I helped them open those stores too. Mm -hmm. Um, Lucky Brand Jeans, obviously the acquisition and then Kate Spade. So all of those were, I say, my master's program. Um, amazing. Yeah, so it was amazing. And then moved over. I never thought I'd leave Lucky Brand Jeans by any means. It was a, a beautiful job. I had a great career there. Um, lots of my dearest friends. Moved over to Louis Vuitton for five years. Um, oversaw their stores, their flagship stores within Saks and Macy's Herald Square, um, which is big business. These are like $27 million you know, yeah. 2000 square foot stores. So if you can wrap your head around that. Lots of revenue that you're in. Lots for. of revenue. And, you know, working for a luxury brand, I come from a family of business owners. Um, I come from a mom who's a carpenter. So I've always really appreciated like craftsmanship. And when I worked for Lucky, the Junes are all handmade in LA and we'd go watch it be done. And going to work for Louis Vuitton was a kind of a natural progression, to be honest. I didn't come from a luxury world. Like I'm like a girl literally from Wyoming. I drove a pickup. Um, I went to rodeos, like I was that girl, and now here I'm in New York City <laughs> working for Louis Vuitton, um, and which I started right as the recession started. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> um, so went to work for Louis Vuitton, and I just became really obsessed with the art of craftsmanship. Um, and the beauty of it was shortly, or actually no, when I joined Louis Vuitton, I was also planning my wedding. Um, mm. And I'm sure if my wedding planner is listening to me now, she'd be like, you're planning your wedding? I didn't do anything. Um, I entrusted a planner to do the entire thing while yeah. I continued to run my fabulous businesses in New York City. Um, but uh, I also kind of became obsessed with photography. And I, th I always had been because mm -hmm. um, I think I remember when I was a kid, I only remember like five photos from my childhood. And, wow. and I always, I think it always kind of left a hole in my heart because I was always like, I'm such a visual person. Um, like math science was not my, it was not my game. Um, and so I was always such a visual person. So like memories and stories are kind of what I lived off of, but I didn't really have that visual aid to, to match to that. So I get engaged. I'm getting married to an amazing man. Um, and I start looking for my wedding photographer while I'm with Louis Vuitton. And of course the bar starts setting really high because all I'm seeing is Anna Leibowitz's work <laughs> with like Angelina Jolie campaign and all of that. And, um, I just, you know, I threw myself into like looking for this perfect photographer that would capture my wedding in the way I wanted to remember it. Um, and it was hard. I mean, it was first of all hard because I thought I was like a big shot spending like $2,500 on wedding photography. Aww. And I found that to get the photographer I wanted, I had to spend about like three times, okay, maybe four times that amount. <laughs> <laughs> um, but at zero regrets, um, 
But in that process, it definitely lit a fire in me. And I was traveling with Louis Vuitton to the workshops in Italy for our shoes and obviously Paris for the handbags. And I become kind of transcended into like this world of creating something by hand. Um, and a lot of the craftsmanships for the craftsmen for them, their generations, 10 generations of shoemakers, like it's pretty amazing stuff. And so I'd photograph like their hands, like where like their nails were really short and their hands making the shoes and the way they would like stroke the handbags and like there was so much pride in every single piece they were touching. And so I'd photograph like their hands and their feet, the way they were positioned when they were sitting and like kind of more the emotion of it versus like the act of what they were doing. Yeah. And uh, the corporate office obviously caught wind of this and said, hey, when you come back from one of your trips, send us in all your imagery you've been capturing. So I did. And they made a book. Oh, and, um, I kind of always say, I think that was the day I knew that I was a photographer. Okay. Um, I definitely never was before. Mm -hmm. I completely self-taught. Um, but there was just something like it, it definitely let a fire in my soul. So fast forward, I moved from New York city to Orlando and being disconnected from my corporate team and everything like that. It just felt very different. Yeah. Um, the fulfillment I was getting, and I mean, I'm a worker, so like mm -hmm. I definitely am a workaholic. Um, I believe in every company I've ever worked for. Otherwise I wouldn't be with them. I'm not someone that will sit somewhere that's not happy. Um, mm -hmm. But I relocated and I started really understanding when you're not in New York city at the top of your game, like you're kind of second. Gotcha. And so, so what does that mean it's for people who are newer and don't know what, what, what do you um, mean by that? I think when you're at the helm of things, you have a little bit more control. People trust you. Mm -hmm. and so like no one really questions what you're doing in your business and why. Gotcha. They're, they're seeing the results, right? Yep. They're right there. They're seeing the results and, you know, moving to a remote market down in Florida, um, definitely was not the case. It was more like an employee. Gotcha. And I had never felt like an employee in any of my careers. You know, I guess I've had one career, but none of um, the places I've worked. Yeah. And I started to feel like that. And I was like, wow, I work really, really hard. Like I kind of work my ass off. Yeah. And all of a sudden here I was like, requesting time off. Like, can I take a day off? And I'm like, Oh, I'm, you know, 30 some years old. Why I'm really asking permission to take a day off. Like this feels right. awkward to me. You know, I've been running hundreds of millions of dollars of business and you know, I had a daughter. Um, I definitely was not the mom. Like I'm a mom. I'm going to stay home now and <laughs> try to shoot that. photography with a camera because that makes, I can stay home. By the way, if you start a business and you think that you are going to be working from home, you are going to work harder than you have ever worked in your ever. entire life. Ever. So like, don't think this is a good thing for your kids. Like, don't be like, oh, I had a baby. I'm going to work from home and it's going to be this beautiful life. It, I mean, unless it's like a hobby, maybe, um, but really you're going to work the hardest, but you are going to reap the most benefits that you've ever reaped in your entire life too. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, it was spring of 2013. I had shot a wedding of one of my employees. Um, I'll speak about this maybe a little bit later, but her photographer backed out on her a week before her wedding. The week what? Of mm -hmm. You know, it's, she didn't read the fine print and, you know, mm. she thought she had paid a lot of money for them. And then they kind of dove into their final payment and read like, oh, they actually didn't get their imagery. They'd have to buy every single frame afterwards. That's nuts. And you know, I told her, I was like, well, that's why he was $1,500. Like I kind of understood why he was $1,500 because he's going to make 4,000 by the time you guys are done. Yep. And he deserves that because it's a lot of work, yeah. but it just wasn't clear to them up front and they weren't prepared to make that investment. So, um, I said, you know, she asked me, would you, would you step in and shoot it? And I said, oh no, like I covet that role of photographer very high. And I remember the pressure I put on my photographer. Like, I don't think I'll ever do weddings, like family sessions. This is fun for me. Again, I wasn't becoming a photographer at this time. Finally, I was like, okay, I'll do it. And you know, I threw myself into her wedding. I remember this December 30th of 2012. And I, by the end of the day, my heart was on fire. It was chaotic. There was drama you know, I was like, wow, this is where I'm supposed to be. It was like being a director in retail. It was like coordinating and managing people and capturing moments and emotion and guidance and direction and tears. And I was like, this is the most amazing thing ever. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and so, you know, I kind of was kind of fed up in a job where like I was working hard, but like I still wasn't owning my own time. And so I looked at my husband and I said, I think I want to become a wedding photographer. And he's like, really? And I was like, if I was to leave, 
And I am, a, I am a contributor of my family's finances in a big way. So I looked at him. So I might be not everybody's situation. I said, how long? Like, how long do I have before I need to, like, make money? Yeah. Um, you know, and I'm leaving a high six-figure paying job. <laughs> and he said, six months. It's enough. Enough. Did you feel like that was enough time? Um, I mean, if you're me, <laughs> I, I will tell you now, I did not make it. I, I did do a network marketing company, which fell on my lap at the same time that they set some pretty big goals. And I was like, oh, I could crush those. So I had that support cushion of something else I was doing on, along the side. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I left my job because I was like, oh, I can make a little bit of money in this network marketing company. Um, so that really supported us while I ran really hard and steady fast after my photography business. And it was with a very strategic plan of like, what my brand needed to look like, who I need to be surrounded with, whose work I would look at and just feel something. Um, so I knew who my, I needed to align myself with. Um, and I ran fast and hard and it was a beautiful journey. I, I will tell you right now, there's plenty of times in those first two years when other luxury retailers would call me and offer me positions that like, I was like, Ooh, that sounds really good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I will say after two years, I never looked back. Um, and so, you know, 15 minutes later, there's kind of my intro story. I'm and not that's, like a 15 second elevator pitch. <laughs> that's how you got into the weddings and events industry. Mm -hmm. I just, I think the most creative people that I interview and talk to and do projects with and gravitate towards, we're all, I don't, I don't want to say like self-taught, but it's like we were born with this thing inside of us and we're constantly searching, but like not really knowing we're, we're searching for like that right thing. And then you fall into it and you just keep following and following your heart and doing something different and like knowing. And then a lot like you, when I started to get into weddings, I'm like, oh, this is why God put me on this earth as cheesy as it is. Oh, 100%. Yeah. No, it's just, 100%. You know, there was a hand thing, guiding that situation 100%. Totally. It's like one thing leads to another thing, which leads to another thing. And, you know, one thing that I'll say that I'm sure you'll, you will share with our listeners in a little bit um, is you have taken all this experience, amazing experience, and you've built on it and you never stay sitting and like stagnant. It's like, okay, I know I'm a great photographer. I know I can do this. I know I can, but I can also do this. And take all That's of these. You thought I them. thought that. <laughs> I was like, "Oh shit! I don't know what I'm doing." <laughs> but you surround yourself with the people who you have a vision, and you know you want to get there, and you know that you are going to get there. You don't really know how sometimes, but you know you keep getting people plopped into your life, or they keep popping up on your feed. Like it's funny, I've had people that are like, "You keep popping up on my feed." And I'm like, well, that's called consistent posting. <laughs> you know, like I am here to help. Or you're uh, engaging with me and you don't realize it. Thanks. Yeah. So <laughs> it's just, it's, um, so I'm excited for our listeners to hear in, in a moment, like how you have taken that stepping stone. But before we even get there, just like on the photography side, like the special and the uniqueness and the service that you provide, like, yes, you have all of these years with these wonderful brands, very high expectations, perfection. How is that rolled over into your brand? And I mean, I think it makes you special and unique, but <laughs> our listeners don't know that. So I mean, I am a little special. That, that might be true. <laughs> <laughs> I love that new phrase. I wish I would have came up with that. I'm a little extra. extra. Um, I think here's the thing. You know what? I'm actually going to probably shock you. What I learned was guess what? It's smoke and mirrors, right? Yep. And so, you know, I mean, and now in the, the, the age of social media, it's smoke and mirrors, guys. Like, forgive yourselves. Unplug once in a while. Like, it is smoke and mirrors. And so, you, you know, when I, I still remember, I, I got to watch, I got to watch um, Anna Leibwitz shoot. And I don't get starstruck. I mean, once you work for Louis Vuitton long enough, you just, there's no starstruck in it. You get to see people really as they are when people are buying luxury handbags in the recession. Yep. Um, and so I got to see her shoot part of the campaign. And I remember going into it and being like, oh, I get to see Annie Levy. It's like, this is amazing. I mean, her work has like just moved my soul from day one. Um, and I saw her get up there and I saw all the assistants step into place. and. It happened. And then I was like, Oh, that's it. I could do that. <laughs> yeah. I was like, wait a minute. 
I mean, I know how to give people direction. I can delegate. Like, wow, that's how that just happened. That's right. Um, and so, you know, what I learned was I had Annie up here, like in an unbelievable place because of her raw talent of capturing people exactly who they are. Mm-hmm. And when I saw how she did it, I was like, oh, I, I could do that because I held that role so high. So I think going into my brand and what was special and unique is, you know, I know that like, I felt extremely special when Joe was my photographer. Mm-hmm. I felt honored. I felt obligated to him, mm-hmm. you know? So I, um, I really kind of went into my business and said, how do I want my clients to feel? So I didn't even think about the photography. Is that weird? No, it's all about the experience. Yeah. Because, you know, here's the thing, like I got Joe in the beginning of, and if anyone wants to know, I could give him a pitch, Joe Cogliandro. Amazing. Amazing man. If you ever look up his work, it will blow your mind. And I got him early on in his career. He's now like one of the top awarded photographers in the world. Um, I got him early on in his career and it was about the way he made me feel. I already loved his photography. So that spoke volumes already. I didn't need to know more about that, but I was going to have this guy beside me when I'm like with my mom crying my eyes out when I'm like naked, getting in my wedding dress. Like I'm going to have this dude with me and there, there has to be some kind of relationship going on. And he was willing to go that extra mile for me. So like when we hired him, he's like, you know, I've never shot in New York city, which that's me also bragging. I was his very first shoot in New York city. And now when you see what he's done in New York city, it's unbelievable. And, you know, he was like, Hey, get me out to New York for your engagement session. Just cover my cost of travel and I'll be there for you. And that I was like, wait, Joe Coglandra is going to just, it's only be a price of a plane ticket and he's going to come to me. It was the way he made me feel. It was the same with my wedding planner. It was just that feeling. So I knew when I sat down to say, okay, on paper, what is Kathy Thomas photography going to be like? It all fell back to feelings. You know, I want, I'm like usually the third person to see my bride's wedding gown. That's and, awesome. Yeah. And I want to see it. Like when I sit down to meet with them, I'm like, okay, let's talk about how you met. Okay. Can I see your wedding dress? <laughs> uh, you know, and I come Details. from a fashion background. Yeah. I come from a fashion background. Yep. So like, you know, I know the importance of that. I bought three wedding gowns. Like the wedding dress, I was like, I love dresses. So wedding gown was easy for me. But then I realized it also needed to make me feel and think I was a bride. Um, totally. And so, you know, I'm the third one to see their wedding gown. I, when I meet with clients and I always tell them like, come interview me. Like, I know you see me on social media, but of course I'm putting my best leg forward. I need you to say, I want Kathy to be beside me at my wedding day. Yeah. Because I'm going to be with you eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours. And my relationship with you really starts after the wedding. So like our relationship doesn't end when everyone strikes everything at your wedding. Our relationship starts from the first time you hire me until weeks and sometimes a year if it takes my clients that long to make an album we're still in this together so you know you have to enjoy me you have to trust me um you know people are paying for a service they're paying me you know they're not getting something tangible right out of the gate so you know i really want to open up that that door to say come come make sure i'm the right person for you and i'll be honest in the interim of that I also want to make sure you're the right person for me because I don't want to be at every wedding. This is not a numbers game for me. If it was a numbers game, I would go back to luxury retail. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to be, I want you to be the right client for me too. I want my clients to touch each other when they're sitting on my sofa and I want them to, you know, I love when I ask the groom, if, if it's a groom, groom or a bride, bride situation, like I say, you know, what are you looking most forward to that day? That answer is more important to me than them saying what collection they want to invest in me. That's awesome. I mean, Would you say, like, my next question for you is, like, what is the top thing that your clients love, which I feel like you touched on that, but, like, you're a super genuine just person and asking about the details and making them feel important. Like, you're you're not just doing that because psychology says that's going to get you clients. Like, you are genuine in your fact-finding. So, yeah, I can't do what I do if I don't have those details. I mean, and okay, let me add this. I get hired for weddings where like the planner brings me on, flies me to wherever I need to go, and I meet the couple the second I walk in the door. It happens. And I'm honored that they're trusting me without ever meeting me. But when I'm shooting that wedding, the person that has the trust in me is the planner. So I'm going to shoot it just like they were my client. Do you know what I'm saying? Because they trusted me. So I'm going to pour my all into this client like I've been courting them the whole time too, because there's someone who's investing in me from an emotional standpoint. And then the client is doing it from a financial standpoint. 
So there is those situations that are few and far between, like maybe five a year, but the rest of the clients I know, I have their cell phone number, we talk regularly. Um, what did you ask? <laughs> <laughs> we're the same. we're so, so much the same. <laughs> Just like what do your clients love most? And oh <laughs> and it's funny because that you, you say it like that because um you came and shadowed a strategy session that I'd done for a venue and you were sharing some of your experiences with the gentleman and I loved what you were saying, how you are investing and in, because we were talking about the venue investing and making sure that the load in and the load out and the process and the vendors, if you take care of your vendors and you have a great relationship and you communicate the good, the bad, the ugly, which we only know, come on, it makes us stronger and better. And if we do something that could hurt our brand or there's a better way to do it, effing tell me, like, yeah. don't be afraid to approach and say, hey, I've done it you know, a better way or there, there is another way. Um, and he loved that about you just by saying, Oh, I never considered, you know, he was so focused on booking clients for weddings that I'm like, let's take a step back here. And then you yes. were able to add all this commentary of like, okay, yes, it's the client, but I'm going to have an ongoing relationship with the planners and the, the other vendors. So of course I'm going to treat them as if they were my client as well. So I love that. Yeah. And I mean, so, and so you segued right into it. Like truly what they love is that I will admit my faults. Like mm -hmm. I've come to this age where guess what? I am not perfect. Shit, I'm far from it. I will do my best as a photographer to give you beautiful imagery that will be delivered on time that, you know, I mean, our, I'm a little bit of an over pleaser. I'm the baby of nine girls. Um, Wait, what? I didn't know that. You have nine yeah. girls in your family? Yes. Holy shit. Yes. yes. Um, <laughs> and so I'm definitely a pleaser and I'm like a Mimi. Today's my birthday. Obviously, I have to plug Happy it. Birthday, <laughs> yeah. um, and so, you know, for me, it's like admitting my shortcomings, but also wanting to please. So, and there's a line that can be drawn with that, right? But with my clients, there's pretty much nothing they can ask me that I won't do. Mm -hmm. And I truly mean that. Like, I've had grooms, I've been in the Ritz Carlton and the groom's like, Hey, I'd really love this beautiful photo of me taking my wife's dress off. I'm like, cool, let's go. I'll be there. You know what I mean? Like, that's awesome. If that's how you want to remember you're the end of your wedding night, I'm in like, I'd love that. You know, I just recently did, it was truly like sessions that like the Yoko Ono photo of her and John, like, you know, he's naked and curled up against her is a, an image. Like I could probably tell you every hair placement on their body. Cause I have looked at that image in so many ways. Like right now I have goosebumps from like my toes to my hairline. Um, so like when I look at capturing a moment, like there's nothing pornographic about that to me. There's nothing gross. I mean, to me, it's just the beauty of this moment of people being in a moment that get just got frozen. I have the worst memory on the planet. So I tell my clients that like, do I will write everything down. I have the worst memory in them. So when they're like, Hey, did you send that? I'm like, sure I did. And I go, and I'm like, Oh, it's in my drafts. I'm sorry. Here it comes. So again, I'm admitting that false. Like, I'm not gonna be like, Oh yeah, I sent it. It didn't go through. Like, I'm like, yeah, it's sending my drafts. I'm so sorry. Like I am so transparent when it comes to that because I'm not perfect. Um, and I think that's what I learned from my background is that like, a lot of things you see in the luxury world are smoke and mirrors. Like the front mm -hmm. looks amazing. The back is crumbling. <laughs> um, yeah. So like my, my brand, my photography looks beautiful. Um, I just gave myself compliments. Nice. But, but like, I'm not perfect, you know, and you know, I'd like to be, and I beat myself up probably more than I need to. And a lot of times I'm like, I'm so sorry. And they're like, Oh, I wasn't even expecting that. So thanks. Um, but I think they like that they can be genuine with me. Mm -hmm. Um, and super transparent and I'm going to be the same way with them. Mm -hmm. Um, and so again, I think that just opens up that relationship when, you know, they're going through things. I mean, I have clients call me and they're like, shit, Kathy, I just got my floral, you know, my, my floral proposal back and it's like $27,000 for flowers. Is that insane? I'm like, yes, but it's going to be beautiful. So let's <laughs> do this. Like <laughs> if that is in your, your, if you have an allocated amount, look at that, Angela, I took that from you. I'm um, to go towards floral for that. Like, let's do it because guess what? You're going to do this one time. Hopefully. And when your kids look at your photos, when you have children, they're going to dream about a wedding that looks like mom and dad's. You're going to already set the expectation that early on, like girl or boy, whatever you deserve this. Yeah. This is the way we celebrate love in this world. Cause guess what? We don't do it enough, especially no. now. No. There's way too much tragedy going on in this world. We don't celebrate 
love enough. And this is that one opportunity for us to say, guess what? Love is worth all of this. And we're going to give everyone that shows up for us an experience and show you that like, if there is, you know, 500 images after this is said and done that speaks to the volume of our love story, here's what it looks like. And it is grand, you know, it's grand floral and it's the most amazing gown that, you know, I can find. And so I, man, I could do this all day long. Isn't it fun? <laughs> I know. So, um, so, we know. You know I will tell you something else too. I want to preface this yeah. because I don't want to sound like such a snob. Sometimes I am my client's biggest investment. I, I have, I have some clients. Um, and I still remember this client. I, I have done all their three kids weddings in South Carolina. They're big Clemson family. And, um, I did their first daughter's wedding. It was a referral to me. I did then their son was getting engaged and, um, his girlfriend was at the wedding I shot. And she said to her soon to be in-laws, the only gift I want for our wedding is Kathy Thomas. Mm. Oh, that's amazing. I know. I'm like, and I showed up to this like home estate place in the middle of nowhere, South Carolina. And here they're pulling in a tractor trailer with a band on it. The whole community setting up like bells of hay and decor that they all come together and made. And I was like, oh my God, I am their biggest investment. Mm -hmm. And let me just tell you, I rock that wedding. I was like, my heart just started seeing all this opportunity and, and it was amazing. Um, and then there's sometimes where like, I'm such an afterthought. They're like, Oh yeah. coming." And um, so I just want to preface that. Like I, I get the beauty of working weddings that have $27,000 floral budgets. And I get the beauty of working ones that are like, well, we're not going to have any floral because we're going to have Kathy here. Yeah. Which is amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, this kind of segues like right into my next question in terms of just, challenges and I, I know you and I know like what the whole smoke and mirrors stuff means I mean we mm -hmm. aren't young spring chickens I love my age I love that I've had a lot of experience <laughs> I love that we both have done a lot of things but there's challenges and so like with this industry specific you know weddings and creatives like what are some of the challenges you see and how are you handling them and overcoming them it's so crazy because you had obviously sent me those questions in advance. Um, so I was prepared to answer them, but I'm going to actually give a different answer because okay. now that I hear you present it that way, I would say the number one thing I would say is wedding professionals that lack the ability to educate their clients. Mm -hmm. And that sounds kind of harsh coming out, but and I'll kind of, you know, build around that a little bit is that you don't know what you know, right? Like when I, when I stepped into my wedding and I was living in New York city, I had my dream job. I found this man. That's amazing. We met right before my 31st birthday. Like, you know, I, I didn't know what I didn't know. I thought I was going to spend $2,500 on a wedding photographer. And by the way, for those who spend $2,500 on a wedding photographer, you can still get beautiful imagery. Yep. Um, I just didn't know the photographer that was right for me was going to be four times that amount. Um, until they educated me. You know, and that's one thing I liked about Joe. He was like, hey, well, you know, you want me in Mexico for four days. <laughs> <laughs> I have a family of four. Um, I run a business. And when he just made that really clear to me, you know, and it's one of those things, he's like, you know, it'll take us 40 hours to edit and deliver your wedding. And he's like, what do you make in a week? And I'm like, oh, duly noted. Definitely more than that. Like, you know what I mean? And I was like, oh, so you're worth this too. Like, I respect what you do. Um, so, you know, educating people. And I think is really, really big. And with that being said, I think it starts from the planner, not to put that pressure back on you. But, but girl, that's all I love, love to do is educate. Yeah, venue and planner, you know, and I love venues that, you know, tell people like, guess what? All of your vendors need to be insured. <laughs> I mean, that's mm -hmm. just a given. 100%. But like, ed, you know, the client's like, oh, I can't just ask my friend with a camera to show up because what if something falls on one of my guests and now who's liable and all these things. Um, there's a lot of moving components that people don't think about that can become liabilities and not even liabilities from a financial standpoint, but liabilities from like losing photos. Um, having, you know, a rental company that doesn't show up because you hire them, but there's no one to guide them, give them a timeline and direct them. So I think that's the biggest pocket of opportunity is the professionals inside our industry knowing it is their responsibility to be the expert, mm -hmm. to educate, to share, you know, what? maybe not educate, maybe I'm not going to use the word educate. It's kind of a really strong term to share 
mm-hmm. put their clients on the forefront and build the expectation that, you know what, if this is what's most important to you, here's what that should look like when you're allocating your budget and here's what your expectation should be to meet that. If this is what's important to you or if this isn't, then guess what? You know, if photography isn't that important to you, like let's spend more money on getting you the best band you want because you just want people to party. Yep. You don't care if it's captured. So let's, let's reallocate and just really, really educate them. I think that's one of the biggest things. So with that being said, then goes back to the answer I had given you was hiring professionals. And, you know, I speak on this on a lot of engagements I speak on. Um, there is three types of people in our industry. I think Angela, or I'd like to believe you're going to agree with me. There's a hobbyist, someone mm-hmm. who has talent, but they're doing this because it's a great hobby to make extra money, right? Yep. They might have either a full-time gig and this is, if they're side hustle, they're probably not a hobbyist. I would say this is literally, there's just their way to get creative, step outside the world they live in, make some money that might allow them some nicer things. Mm -hmm. Um, And by the way, none of these are wrong approaches. It's just how you look at them differently. There's a lifestyle professional. I actually know a lot of these people. They work in the wedding industry to allow them their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So um, it could be their spouse has a really great paying job, but if they plan a couple weddings a year, sh- for, photograph a couple weddings a year, do floral for a couple weddings a year, that money allows them to go to Cabo. That money allows them to drive the luxury car. That money allows them their mani pedi and their Botox, you know, or whatever. Um, <laughs> I love it. You know, I, 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 have, I have these friends. I have these friends that, you know, they, they work for their lifestyle. They're like, mm-hmm. oh, my husband doesn't give me a hard time about, you know, acupuncture and this and my life coach and stuff because I'm, I'm covering it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's like the career professionals that's you and I, you know, Mm -hmm. we look at this for the long term. and this is what we do 80 hours a week. We eat, sleep and breathe it. Mm -hmm. Um, and it is, it is our bread and butter. This is our traditional job in a non-traditional world. Right. Yeah. Um, and again, not that any are wrong. I think just when people go into hiring one of these three people, they need to, adjust their expectations on the back end Mm -hmm. because this is where you see those reviews like, Oh, couple gets married in Hawaii, spends $5,000 on a photographer for five hours and photographer loses their images on a plane. Um, that shit really happened y'all just so you know. Yeah, it really happened. It actually happened to a celebrity. Um, and the thing was, is that was a hobbyist friend that they hired that was like, Hey, I think I want to become, you know, a wedding photographer. Would you support me because we're friends and you're a celebrity and this would be big for my move. But they jumped on a plane right after the wedding to go to Africa and lost their photos because all they had with them on a little memory card. And so, you know, you have to adjust your expectations. If a friend is offering to do my wedding for a thousand dollars because they're doing it nicely, like I kind of have to be like, Oh, what do I want on the back end of that? You know, where maybe someone on the other end of it being a career professional. And here's the thing. A hobbyist and lifestyles might do that. We do this, and I think it makes us unique. We back up our images on site. Mm -hmm. I cannot, I mean, and I do a ton of destination weddings, so this is part of it. I cannot leave the venue unless I know those photos are in three places. Yep. First card, second card. So that has to do with equipment, having backup cards. This is like photography lingo and then backing up to another hard drive. And as soon as we hit a Wi-Fi spot, so it's usually back at the hotel or back in the office, we then back up on an offsite cloud. So our clients the next day get a, you know, instead of waking up and being like, congratulations, you're married. It's like, guess what? Your images are so secured, they're not getting lost. Ever. That's what I want you to wake up. I want you to wake up to that and be like, ah, oh, you know. Um, so again, it's about adjusting expectations and it goes back from the beginning. The planner saying, you know, if your friend who, you know, does photography at your job, it's going to do it as a wedding gift for you, adjust your expectation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it all comes full circle with educating your clients. Um, and, you know, it's okay to start out as a hobbyist. I mean, I did Absolutely. it. Um, and I lived two lives for almost 10 years. <laughs> And I don't know how I did that. Um, But now looking back, you know, I'm very thankful for all of the steps and the things that I learned in healthcare and corporate America and psychology. However, now looking back, I'm like, God, that was really hindering me on making the decisions on the projects that I wanted to take on and the projects 
that it will really of the people <laughs> that people that I could have so much more opportunity and be so much more happy in being surrounded by these people that get me. And really what that was is like entrepreneurship, like tugging at me constantly. Yeah. And, you know, it's like an opportunity is presented. You don't think about it. You jump and then, you know, things are going great. And then you look back in five months and it's like, how the fuck am I going to pay my bills? Like all that money's gone that I saved up. Oh, shit. And then it's like, oh, I'm either going to learn about how to run a business or I'm going to outsource it or I'm going to hire a business manager. And outsource. that's... <laughs> yes, out, exactly. Listen, creative people, delegate outsource. Outsource. Okay. If you're a planner and a designer, or you're a photographer and you do video, and I mean, guys, think about it. I focus on sales. I, I never saw myself as like a sales girl, but actually, after when I'm traveling, I'm out of town and I have my team, which I have an amazing team, but they have a different skill set that they are amazing at. And typically, it ain't sales. And so. <laughs> And we know that because of the outcome after the meeting is like, it. oh, we don't feel that way. But it also comes down to experience and educating and storytelling and sharing. And that all goes back to education. And so that's one thing that I love about you. And, and we take the time to do that, to educate. And you know what? For new people listening, I know what you're thinking. I don't have any education and background and stories and da da da, da to share. So you share other people's stories. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, no. stories, story, I mean, yeah, stories get you where you're going. I mean, yeah. without a story, like where's the truth? No one wants to hear a philosophy. You know, I used to interview people for a living from executive levels down and I'm like, tell me an actual practice. They're like, well, I haven't done that. I'm like, were you in a sorority? And they're like, yeah. So tell me a time that you threw the best damn party ever in a sorority. Yep. Cause that's what, that's how you're going to host people when they walk into your store. Yep. It's the details. So, you know, you kind of have to drill into that. Um, but I mean, you're 100% right. And I do want to add like this was, you know, I was doing the network marketing company side by side to the photography. They're both growing at the same pace. And I had to stop and go, am I giving my network marketing team the same energy and effort I would be giving them if I didn't have photography? And am I giving my clients and my vendors the same? And I was like, I wasn't. I was gaining weight. I was stressing. I was working till 3 a.m. My daughter was like, mommy, don't work. Like break your heart. Mm -hmm. Um, and I finally had to say, I had to let one go. And, you know, um, it's so funny because this morning is my birthday and my upline of my network marketing, she is like the most amazing woman that is always my biggest cheerleader and, you know, slowly is always like, come back over. Um, and she knows how much I love photography. And so, you know, when I left, I had to tell her, this has been amazing. And if I would have found network marketing in college. Like I would have never worked a traditional job. Like it was brilliant. And I was so turned off by it, by the way, so turned off. And I was like, but this is brilliant. It's like, you're your own CEO and making your own money and you're selling great product. Um, but you know, I told her this was the vehicle to get me to live my dream. Yeah. And it was the thing that built my confidence to start my photography business. But my photography business is me living within my dream and being scared shitless every day trying to figure it out. Cause I don't know. I didn't go to school for photography. You know, people ask me all the time, like weekly, you should do a photography workshop. And I'm <laughs> like, uh, really? Like, what do you want me to teach you? And they're like, I don't know. Like, I just, I want to know how you get the settings you get. I'm like, I don't know. I just walk in a room and I do it. And they're like, I know, but what did you think about like this setting? And I'm like, I don't even know the lingo you're using. That's how much I shouldn't teach a photography workshop. I can teach you business and how to live a debt-free life and how to pay for education for your kids and how to trust and value yourself. But I'm not going to tell you how to, you know, how to like run Canon equipment. I have no clue. I look at those cameras. I'm like, eh, like <laughs> flying an airplane for me. I'm like, I don't, I don't know what to do with this. That's um, awesome. But you know, and that's, it's tough for me. I still remember I, I went to Cliff Mottner's photography training. Um, it's the only training I formally have gone to. And I cried. I cried in a room of 30 professionals. I mean, I bawled Aww. and I bawled because someone said, how many stops did you push that? And I was like, um, what do, you, what do you mean? And they're like, you know, and everyone's like, you're Kathy Thomas. And I'm like, I, I don't get what you mean by push stops. And they're like, your settings. And I'm like, um, should I know what this means? Like, I just do it. And here's the whole room looking at me and they're like, how'd you get that image? Like, how'd you push your stops? And I'm like, shit, guys. I was like, I don't know what push stops means. Yeah. They're like, your settings, like your ISO. I was like, then why don't you say ISO? Like, I know what that is. Like, obviously that's how I got the photo. Wow. Um, 
but I realized how much I didn't know about my equipment. I just knew what I wanted to achieve and I knew how to get there. Yeah. And then I realized like after that, I was kind of torn down a little bit and I was like, wow, I really don't know what I'm doing. And then I had a bride send me a review the day I walked out of that workshop and she was like, my mom cried for an hour over your photos. Aww. And she's like, you captured our wedding exactly how we felt that day, though I don't remember any of these moments. And I was like, oh, guess what? I don't know shit about actually physically <laughs> operating my camera. I just know how to make it work for me and yeah. fast. Yeah. Um, and that's what's important, right? I it mean, is. Like yeah. it is, you know, and you know, I wish I could say I went to school for it. I didn't. I'm self-taught. But you know what I did know is I knew that I needed to surround myself with the Angelas of the world, like other people who were in this to win for their clients and their clients mean their vendors and the people who are investing and trusting them in their day. Um, and I just ran with that. I was like, Hey, guess what? I, I, I don't ever need to teach a photography workshop cause I'm going to feel totally degraded. <laughs> um, but I could teach people how to treat their clients. I could teach people how to outsource. You know, I now I'm in a place 30 pounds later because I would just edit, 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 try to improve my website, try to improve my marketing, all these things that I thought were important because we're such a face of our brand. So it's like, mm -hmm. I can't look bad on social media. I, my business card has to be the best looking business card. Um, I have to make it the most witty post. And now I'm like, shit, here's a picture. It almost made me get choked up. See it? <laughs> like, I don't know what else to say. Like <laughs> I felt something in that post. Um, and I'm like, I can't make my grid on Instagram really beautiful. Cause right now I just want to post this moment and it's blue. And I know my grid's supposed to be orange, like whatever. Um, I can teach people just to be really real with themselves, but also to make a living yep. because I will tell you the first thing that's going to happen and you're going to make sacrifices with your clients and your vendors is when you are not charging what you're worth. Mm -hmm. And that is different for everyone. Like, you know, I, I tell people all the time, I, I am like, what did you make in your previous career? And why aren't you there? Like, you know, this should be your hobby. Like you got to be able to stand on your own two feet and last through recessions. And that's how we met Angela. I remember you still yeah. sharing a, a thing in Orlando and you said, this is how I lasted through the recession. I stepped outside myself and I wasn't able to, I was able to be flexible because I had set myself up prior to the recession. So I was able to be flexible to stay in the business to last. Yep. Where other people weren't charging what they're worth. So the recession came and they had no savings. So they had to throw in the towel. Yeah. You know, and it, it was sad because some of the best and the best in the industry were in that boat. Um, and I, it was like that one thing I walked out and I was like, dude, I like that girl shit. <laughs> and I had no clue our paths would ever cross again until I found out I was moving to Nashville and we shared offices next door to each other, which then we didn't even speak. I'd always be like, hey. and you're like, dude, we're crunching away here. Bye. I'm like, hey. we're never, I'm like, we're never there. <laughs> <laughs> we know there us there anymore. <laughs> yeah. We're not there anymore, but you know, um, it, it's just, it's interesting, you know, so I realized that like, not only are probably potential brides, grooms, planners listening to this, but I hope photographers listen to you too, you know, because I think the thing is, is that in your questions and the way you run your business, um, and the way you manage even outside your business, I think anyone could take away from this. And I hope even like couples are listening and saying like, wow, this is me and my job, you know, outside of me planning my wedding right now, um, and take something away because I think it's all some pretty powerful messages, whether it can hurt a little bit or just make you smile. Yeah. So before we jump off, I do want you to mention what's coming up next year ah. for <laughs> Kathy Thomas. Ah, so I am crazy. <laughs> um, and I'm never, I, yeah. Um, so I, one smart thing I did from the get go was I knew working from home was not going like, it sounds good in theory, but let's be real. Like anyone who's listening to this and working from home, look around your house and like, tell me that your home life is exactly how you want it to be while you're working from home. That's my question right there. Mm -hmm. Because I will tell you, I was like, Oh, I'm going to work from home. This is cute. I'm going to set this pretty little office that I'm going to be able to put on Instagram. But what I found was like, I was ignoring my husband at night because I was like, Oh, let me just go check email. Let me send this file. And I was constantly, my office was attached to my kitchen. 
And, you know, I wouldn't do dishes because I was like, oh, I can get back to that later. I need to get back to my client, you know, which whereas I was feeling all this gratification because people were investing me financially, which started feeding this fire in me like, oh, wow, they trust me. And that's where I was getting a lot of my um, solidification, which is completely wrong, by the way. If anyone's out there like, yeah, no, that's not the right way. You can get it from your family and yourself. Um, and so I invested in an office with other creatives. I went in there and I thought, you know what? I remember having two meetings in a coffee shop and it was the most miserable experience. Like I, a homeless person came in who smelled like vinegar, sat down beside us. Oh. I still remember this. I'm like, oh my goodness. I couldn't get on the Wi-Fi at Starbucks to show them a gallery. I had to go use the bathroom. Then I had to stand in line behind three people. Like it was just, I was like, wow, people really tried to run business out of a coffee shop mm -hmm. um, and ask people for money. Like, no. And so I, it took me two meetings. So I went from there and then I went to Panera. That was a little bit better, but then like smelled like onion soup. <laughs> I was like, yes. all the time I said there, my stomach's like growling and I'm like, I'm just hungry here. <laughs> um, and so I got an office and you know, one of two things, it built my confidence because now I was taking control. I was bringing people into an environment where I felt proud and where I said, this is who I am. And this is my brick and mortar. I'm bringing you into my house. Um, so I'm kind of taking control of the scenario again. Um, and I'm able to host you the way I want to host you. I want you to have beer and wine and I want to find out what drinks you like ahead of time. And, you know, I want us to have this like living room experience. It's kind of like the Jerry Maguire thing, right? Mm. Um, so fast forward, I moved to Nashville and I start looking for an office. Um, and Angela and I used to be in an office building, which had an amazing address. <laughs> and zip code. Uh, but it had, you know, can I throw us under the bus here? Um, it had like marriage counselors on our same floor. <laughs> and people who did colonics, which I thought were facials. Yes. <laughs> and then there was like life wellness people. And like, this sounds good in theory, but like the floor is kind of dark and there was lots of like white noise machines. And I mean, Haunted. when I went up there, I was like, okay, I want a massage and I want to sleep. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was like, okay, this isn't going to work. And I'm all about like the feeling, like I'm a photographer, right? So I'm all about the feeling and stuff. And I started shopping around looking for a place that would inspire me and was creative and filled with people like Angela and me that would like sit and have coffee and just fire each other up for the day in 15 minutes. And, you know, I'd feel proud to have people come to, and I, I couldn't find it. You know, I found a lot of great places for businesses, just not for my business. And so then crazy enough, I'm like, I need to open a co-work space where people can come and entertain their clients. They could do the daily grind of their business where when they go home, they're actually on for their family and not half on for their family and half on for their business. Um, so I decided like I need to find a space that is an intimate inspiring space for creatives. They start out with creatives. Now we have so many people on board that aren't in the creative world um, to join us on this venture. And so I'm opening up a intimate luxury co-work space in West Nashville in a historical landmark, gorgeous, gorgeous factory building um, that is going to have flexible memberships for people of all sorts, like scholarship programs and people just getting started, people who are taking their business to the next level, people who need a space to do workshops and coaching moments and training. Um, and I'm want a home where people can come in and feel lifted up every day and work um, at whatever, you know, their desired end result is and have free parking. That's kind of a joke. If you live in a city, like it's like, wow, office building spaces cost enough. Now they need, you have to pay to park. <laughs> um, small details, sister. small details, but then also have accessibility to fitness places and childcare and coffee shops and restaurants, everything that will make you function in one space at a really high level. You can run over on your lunch break and work out and take care of yourself. There's a hair salon down the hall. You could get ready if you have an event immediately after work. Um, you know, there's a dance studio with childcare. Like it, it's just going to be really a fantastic place that I feel like answers a lot of things I needed in a space. Um, and it's going to help people who join grow their business. The people are like, I want to do a workshop, but I can't afford to rent a space in Nashville proper because it's expensive. It's worth it, but it's expensive. And that they can have a workshop in their own office space. Um, they can host events. We're going to have an event space that will actually host like 250 people events. Um, really well around a place for opening in the spring. And um, the other beauty of it is we're actually going to raise the funds 
for the space of the build out off of ifundwomen.com, which I think is also another beautiful avenue for women who are entrepreneurial. Um, and it fell into my lap and I think it's probably one of the most beautiful concepts I've ever seen because people like to give. And now this is given towards the future of someone who's building a community of like-minded people. So. Well said, my friend. Yeah. Yay. Well, let our listeners know where can they find out more about you and where should they follow you? Oh my goodness. So, um, obviously on Instagram, that's kind of my jam. So face my book might not be as appealing though. It's extremely valuable. Um, Instagram is Kathy with a K Thomas photo. Um, we also have started our Instagram page already for the collective. So that's collective six one five. Um, obviously on Facebook, everything is Kathy Thomas photography or collective six one five. And the web addresses are the same Kathy Thomas.com or collective six one five.com. Amazing. Is there any type of a CTA call to action for our listeners that are listening today? There is. So it's interesting because you had asked this question on um, our pre-work and I loved it. So um, coming from the luxury world of retail, I love an incentive as much as the next person. Um, And though I really promote to the people I train, like charge what you're worth, do this, don't discount your work because you're not, you're, you're worth more than that. Um, I love giving incentives. So for anybody who's listening, um, so if you are in the wedding industry and you're looking for mentorships or to attend some workshops or you want more information on the collective, um, there is incentives on that too. So I don't want it just to be a photography thing, but if it is something you're inquiring for photography from branding shoots to photo booth rentals to photography for weddings, lifestyle, and so forth, I am offering some exclusive incentives for you being an Angela Profit listener. Um, so if you contact me through info at kathythomasphotography.com, we have all the information ready to go out to you. Um, everything's a little different per each um, desire you have. So I'm not going to list them all because we'd be here for a little bit. Um, but there is some really great incentives um, to make you fall kind of more in love with myself and my team. That's amazing. Well, Kathy, thank you so, so much for your time today and all of your wonderful insight. I love talking with you and I'm super excited to see what you're building next year and to see how Collective 615 grows. I know the growing is going to be the fun part, right? I mean, we should just get it open first. (laughs) Right, right. But we'll blink our eyes and then it'll be open. Exactly, exactly. So you guys follow, um, you know, on the stories on Instagram. Um, I'm pretty transparent there, so be prepared. Um, But we definitely share a lot of behind the scenes, what's going, what's coming. Um, You know, you can already see beautiful imagery on my my page. So the the stories is our place to really share our successes, our fails, our funnies. I may share that I'm wearing pajamas to my daughter's school after this because it's pajama day there and she wants me to also wear pajamas for her holiday party. I believe I'll be the only parent doing this, <laughs> but I'm not going to let her down. She's seven. She, she, she doesn't need to be letting down until she's like 27. So that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Well, guys, thank you so much for listening today to another episode of Weddings Unveiled. Be sure to tune in next week for another juicy podcast episode. Thank you, Angela. Yeah, sorry. I just want to say thank you. And thank you to everyone listening to my rambling on and on. I get pretty passionate about this. It's so fun. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. Thank you. If you found this podcast helpful, please share it with your friends. And I'm so very grateful if you will leave a review. Be sure you are a subscriber so you never, ever miss the juicy details of Weddings Unveiled. Also, be sure that you're a part of my email list. And if not, you can sign up at AngelaProfit.com where I share valuable resources and exclusive products with only my subscribers. Before I go, I want to ask you, if you have a story or a product to share with the wedding and event industry, please let me know. To be considered as a guest on Weddings Unveiled, visit AngelaProfit.com and submit a podcast guest form. Until next time, remember to stay productive and profitable. You've been listening to Weddings Unveiled with Angela Profit. Join us next time for more insights to help you build a productive, profitable wedding or event business. For more great resources, head over to AngelaProfit.com.